Thank you, Lena, for inviting me to speak about intelligence today. I feel very honored. Um, since I'm not a typical cognitive scientist, um, who you all may expect, um, since this talk is about intelligence, um, I suppose you could say I, could, I focus on a certain type of cognition as a professor of management and organizational behavior. It is from this perspective that I will speak about what makes organizations work intelligently, or at least what we know so far. And um, although I'm a researcher, a theorist by trade, I had the very unique opportunity to personally experience how much intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. And interestingly, this holds true for organizations as much as for individuals. So one year ago, I was asked to take on the responsibility for our publishing house. Our university has enough students to fill a soccer stadium enrolled in distance learning. And um, in order to reduce textbook costs, we produce our own books, our own question banks, and our own video material as well. The department that I had the honor to captain was sinking under the heavy demand. And uh, we started offering many new majors, um, yet the publishing house did not have the staff or resources um, to keep up. They were far behind schedule with their publications and team morale was dismal. And one of the stumbling blocks was a lack of schedule and priorities. Um, a plan of how the vast backlog should be tackled was needed. Um, team members were overwhelmed and to them it just seemed like too much to handle. So how did we go from discouraged, from low productivity individuals to a team that tripled output, increased efficiency by 50% and more than double employee satisfaction in only 12 months? Now, I don't have a background in the publishing industry, um, aside from my own academic contributions, and I don't have a background in operations research. What I did have at that point of taking over responsibility was this. I had sympathy, um, sympathy for the 100 people being overwhelmed by the vast amount of work in the backlog. Um, and I was dedicated to producing the best learning material possible for our students. And I had profound theoretical knowledge about organizational behavior and org design. But most importantly, I had five phenomenal people that had been working with me for a few years who were up for the challenge of transforming our publishing house. And after gathering insight from the editors, the video team and the graphic designers that are all in this publishing house, um, it quickly became clear that we would need a more intelligent system in order to get the books, questions and videos published on time. What we set out to do was find the most intelligent way to rethink and reorganize the department. But what makes an organization intelligent? Um, we can debate the merits of two different units of analysis. First, individuals in the system need to be intelligent. And later, I will dive deep into how emotional intelligence can profoundly help here. Second, the system needs to be able to adapt to change. Agile structures have shown that they are able to be flexible and to be adaptable in many different situations and contexts. They are adaptable due to their inherent structure of trial and error, of iteration, and uh, with each iteration cycling through requirements, designing, testing, and revising. They are flexible due to close contact among team members and frequent feedback loops. Agile systems focus on encouraging teams to reflect on what makes them better and faster. And most importantly, they focus on outcomes. But transforming a traditional waterfall production system is difficult and challenging. Systems that are used to heavy upfront documentation a low tolerance for uncertainty, um, siloed functional departments with little to no cross-functional goals and an aversion to iterative testing approaches will not easily let go of that which has provided a sense of stability up to that point. Agile structures demand a lot from their workers. They demand greater customer focus and less management control. 
They demand workforce emancipation to make their own decisions without hierarchical approval. They demand close and frequent communication among team members and they demand forging strong cross-functional collaboration. Now, to address these demands, we first emulated the Volvo production model with autonomous workgroups. For those of you who are not familiar with the Volvo model, in the 90s, last century, uh, they were the first ones to experiment with self-managed teams in their Swedish car manufacturing plant. They pioneered the system that breaks production lines down into self-managed teams and thereby increase their production speed and reduce defects substantially. Applying this idea, we broke down the functional structure of our publication house with cross-functional autonomous work groups with former members of editorial, design, video, and revision groups. And every functional role is now represented at least once per team so that every team has the capability to produce a complete set of media for any given class. Drawing on the agile organizational model used by another Nordic company, Spotify, we supported each role by a center for excellence. These centers help connect all the members of a role and they foster the process quality in the respective roles. Second, we formed these work groups around academic clusters. We now have a dedicated group for engineering, one for IT, one for social work, and so on. We then went on and assigned an academic expert with a background in the corresponding field to the team. This way, any academic issue can be solved extremely fast and with appropriate academic depth. Now that we had broken down the massive amount of production into a manageable workload among smaller and more capable teams and had empowered them by giving them the freedom to organize their work in a way that works best for them, we looked beyond organizational structures for intelligent features. What we found was that agile structures bear the unique opportunity of seizing swarm intelligence. Swarm intelligence refers to the effective, collective behavior of, for instance, insects. They can even behave as a superorganism or a group of organisms that demonstrate intelligence and capability beyond any one individual. Bees, um, like normal honeybees, um, are a great example of behaving like a superorganism. They are very susceptible, for example, um, to changes in temperature. In response to fluctuations in temperature in their hive, the colony is able to maintain a near constant uh, core temperature by moving individuals in concerted ways to consolidate heat or channel it away from the hive. Um, and their coordinated efforts from highly connected individuals allow tasks impossible for individuals to be performed as a matter of daily life in the group. Bees also demonstrate flexibility for a common purpose. For instance, individuals specialize in certain tasks and yet the allocation of work can be flexible. When food is scarce, for instance, nurse bees taking, um, or no, originally tasked with uh, caring for the next generation will pivot to help the hive by foraging. Using honeybees as a model, we aimed at making the teams even more flexible by expanding every team member's scope. While we have specialized roles in the teams, as I said, video, editorial, design, we managed um, to set up a specific development program that we call badges so that team members can acquire the most time critical competencies of their neighboring roles. This way, when bottleneck situations occur due to tight publishing timelines, they can perform basic competencies of other roles to assist where needed and expand capacity of that role. In a way, the swarm can move towards more editorial capacity or towards more video or design capacity. So let's recap. We restructured our digital publishing production into autonomous groups 
and we installed the badge system to expand individual competencies, enabling us to develop swarm intelligence. Yet, intelligence is commonly understood as an individual difference, oftentimes measured by the so-called IQ. While IQ is widely known, EQ, the emotional intelligence quotient, has been shown to be much more powerful in the workplace. For instance, EQ has been shown to predict leader emergence, which means that people with a higher EQ are more likely to be chosen as leaders. Research also demonstrated that team members of leaders with a higher EQ will be more satisfied with their jobs. But what exactly is emotional intelligence? It is defined as the capacity to be aware of, control and express one's emotions and to handle interpersonal relationships judiciously and empathetically. The domain model groups um, emotional intelligence into four domains along two different dimensions. One dimension is personal versus social competence and the other dimension is recognition versus regulation. Self-regulation is one of those four domains and um, can be seen as a personal competence on the level of recognition. It pertains to awareness of your own emotional state, recognizing how your behavior impacts others and realizing how others' behavior influences your emotional state. Self-management then is the personal competence on the level of regulation, so not just recognition, but now regulation, um, which goes beyond mere recognition of what is going on with your own emotions. Self-management means being able to keep disruptive emotions in check, to act in congruence with your values, and to pursue goals despite setbacks and obstacles. Social awareness is a social competence on the level of recognition, which means you can pick up on the mood in a room and read between the lines when you talk to others. And lastly, relationship management pertains to the social competence on the level of regulation, which enables you to get along with others well, to handle conflict effectively, and to manage interactions with others successfully. Keeping all the empirically substantiated positive effects of EI, so emotional intelligence, in mind, more effective leadership, higher team satisfaction, and even better health, we actively looked for indicators of emotional intelligence while recruiting for the understaffed department. To find individuals with high emotional intelligence, we not only emphasized testing for it during interviews, where we checked if people have self-awareness, if they have self-management and relationship management skills, but we also adopted a very cool method presented by Vishen Lakhiani in his fantastic book, The Buddha and the Badass. It's called the What Makes Us Weird exercise, and it is designed to first distill and second communicate the quirks of a team to potential candidates. So we sat down and noted all aspects of what typical situations would be very unique to working with us. For instance, we make decisions at lightning speed. Um, we receive lots of top management attention and we embrace a fail fast approach. And with this combination of laying out exactly what to expect when working with us, along with the specific tests for emotional intelligence and in interviews, when we hired, um, we found really very, very good people who then in turn help to turn morale around and to raise the positive energy across the whole department. Today, um, I'm beyond grateful for the strong team and their extraordinary emotional intelligence, their grit and their ability to keep going when it gets rough. I sincerely hope I could provide you with some ideas for your next management challenges. And thank you very much. <laughs>